at its core, burn-in is related to the longevity of a TV, which is why it's been such a focus on this test. While burn-in is inherent to OLED technology, manufacturers can compensate for it through software designed to improve the usable life of your panel. Fortunately for you, manufacturers implement this well, meaning that permanent burn-in isn't that big of a concern for most folks. Unless you're using an ultra-wide OLED monitor, that is. Hi, I'm Abby from Ratings.com, where we've now reached over 5,000 hours of runtime on our longevity test. In our last video, we did a deep dive into short compensation cycles, a feature of OLED TVs that accounts for temporary image retention. You can watch that video here, but we'll do a quick recap later. In this video, we're going to look at permanent burn-in. We'll discuss what it is, what manufacturers do to delay its impacts, and what you can expect from your OLED TVs and monitors. Contrary to what its name suggests, burn-in has nothing to do with fire and everything to do with the nature of organic compounds. All OLED panels have an electroluminescent layer made up of organic compounds that are responsible for creating light giving OLEDs their name, organic light-emitting diode. And the cool thing about these compounds is that they have one predictable trajectory, degradation and eventual death. As the pixel degrades, the brightness decreases. Eventually, the whole panel will be affected, but certain areas may deteriorate faster than others depending on your use, resulting in differential wear. The affected areas appear dimmer than the others around them, giving burn-in that signature scorched look. Degradation can be worsened by playing bright content with elements appearing in the exact same spot repeatedly. Because of its inevitable nature, manufacturers incorporate features into the TVs to compensate for permanent burn-in and try and make your panel look fresher for longer. We call these mitigation features long compensation cycles. And when compared to short compensation cycles, it can be confusing. So we'll do a quick recap here to show you the difference. Short cycles last under 10 minutes, should occur after four plus hours of cumulative usage, are called pixel cleaner, refresher, panel calibration cycle, screen optimization, and remove accumulated temporary image retention caused by TFT drift. By contrast, long compensation cycles vary in length from a minute or so on newer panels to an hour on older panels are advertised on some models to occur at intervals ranging anywhere from 500 to around 2,000 hours of cumulative usage, are called pixel refresher, panel refresh, or just pixel refresh, and compensate for permanent electroluminescent layer degradation. It's important to note that these long cycles don't fix the pixels and return them back to their out-of-the-box state. They aren't some sort of OLED philosopher's stone. Instead, they try to establish uniformity across the panel. Now, we don't know exactly how they're doing that, but we have some theories, just nothing concrete yet. What we do know is the visual impact these cycles have on your TVs. As mentioned, we've now accumulated over 5,000 hours of runtime on this test, so most of our OLEDs that have a long cycle built into the software should have run at least two of these cycles by now. We can check to see how many cycles have run on some LG models where there's a cycle tracker in the service menu, but for others, like Sony and Samsung models, we really can't be sure if they have run any long cycles during the test. All we can rely on is what we see on the screens. In general, we found that like with short cycles, long cycles also seem to run differently across brands and panel manufacturers. Let's take the first example of the Sony A80J. We discovered in our last investigation that the Sony A80J wasn't performing short cycles on our test, resulting in a lot of accumulated image retention on the screen. When we run a short cycle, it already improves drastically. But what about the long cycle? After running the panel refresh, Sony's long cycle, the A80J's burn-in appearance has significantly improved, almost to the point where there's no visible burn-in save for the faint hint of an outline. I'm going to take a beat here to distinguish what we're seeing. On the left, we have 5% gray uniformity slides. On the right, 50% gray uniformity slides. We use the 5% slides to better see what's going on with the panel, as even subtle differences in brightness are much more noticeable when the screen is dimmer. The 50% slide is more representative of what you'd see at home just watching TV. This is the full impact these long cycles can have. In an ideal scenario, this is how it would always work. Burn-in is well compensated for, and the panel appears to maintain a uniform brightness across the screen. 
On the other Sony OLEDs like the A90J and A90K, the panel refresh performs similarly. These two models didn't improve as much as the A80J, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the A90K and A90J are more prone to burn-in. As for the QD OLED model, the A95K, well, it didn't really improve much at all. But it is important to take these results with a grain of salt, as there could be software differences in how this compensation algorithm works across models, and differences in panel manufacturing tolerances, etc. Like the Sony OLEDs, the LG OLEDs also exemplify how these cycles are supposed to work. The LG OLEDs run their cycles automatically on an interval schedule of 2,000 hours for the older models like the A1, B1, C1, and G1, and 500 hours for the recent models like the C2, C3, G2, and G3. The B2 is an outlier, though more recent, it is on the older cycle. LG models call their long and short cycles the same thing, which is obviously confusing. So, if you're going to manually run a cycle, it isn't clear which one you're running. It depends on how frequently your TV runs the long cycle, but the simplest way to see is just by opening the pixel refresh window and checking whether the TV asks you to wait an hour, indicating that you can manually run a long cycle, or wait 10 minutes for a short cycle. For those at home who may be wary about running these cycles, we've received some good insights through our communication with manufacturers. Notably, LG Display shared with us that you can run long cycles whenever you want, without harming the panel. You'll likely experience diminishing returns after running a single cycle, but you will be able to address image retention on your own at home. After our last video pointed out that the Samsung S95C didn't run its short compensation cycles as intended, Samsung Display reached out to us to let us know that that was the result of a bug. A firmware update should fix the issue, and the S95C will run the short cycles automatically as intended. But that's not all about the S95C. Samsung Display also let us know that the S95C doesn't run long cycles, but that's by design. Instead, it uses what they call enhanced real-time compensation. We don't know exactly what that means, but it does imply that the S95C is continuously running compensation algorithms instead of waiting for a certain threshold of cumulative hours to run one big cycle. Whether this improves things and makes the S95C twice as reliable, as claimed, remains to be seen in the long run. But when compared to the S95B at the same point in the test, yeah, the S95C looks much better. So far, Samsung's new approach to mitigating burn-in on the S95C appears to be working. The S95B, however, appears to be using the same approach found with the Sonys and LGs. Instead of enhanced real-time compensation, the S95B required you to manually run long cycles after 2,000 to 2,400 hours of use. Considering the times we live in, I think it's fair to assume that only a handful of people actually remembered to do that. Fortunately, Samsung released a firmware update for the S95B so that the TV will just do it itself. Our S95B does something a little funky with its long cycle. As you can see, instead of matching the brightness, the S95B overcorrects, with the affected pixels instead coming out visibly brighter than the surrounding ones. And yes, this is noticeable in real content as well, which is a new type of distracting. We suspect that over time, these over-brightened pixels will end up degrading even faster than they would from just playing CNN, as they're likely receiving more current to output more light, resulting in faster wear. Of course, with a sample size of one, we aren't too sure if this is just our unit or something that these TVs do in general, so S95B owners, let us know if this is something you've experienced after you've run the pixel refresh function. All this knowledge is great to know if you want to buy an OLED TV, but OLED monitors are slowly starting to creep into the sphere, and at this moment, the question on everyone's mind is whether they should be. Of course, for gamers, it's hard to compete with the near instantaneous response times and stunning HDR performance, and the deep blacks make places like the Underdark even more immersive. But like us, many of you have questioned how they handle burn-in. We have three OLED monitors on our test the LG 27GR95QEB using an LG Display OLED panel, the Alienware AW3423DWF, and the Samsung Odyssey OLED G8, both using a QD OLED panel from Samsung Display. Now, when we look at all three of them in their baseline state, they don't look too bad. The burn-in is much more noticeable in the 5% slides than the 50% slides, which is what we expect, but the burn-in pattern is painting an interesting picture. 
When we first put these monitors on the test, we had them display CNN with the default 16 by 9 aspect ratio. We then learned from Samsung Display that this caused some unintended consequences. Namely, the black bars along the sides in 16x9 mode lowered the average picture level, resulting in the display driving the center of the screen, where there was more action, to a higher brightness, subjecting it to more stress. Higher stress usually results in faster wear, so it only took 700 hours of running it at 16x9 mode for heavy differential wear to occur. This also had impacts on the Dell monitor, as it uses the same panel, so for fairness, we changed all the screens to display CNN in full screen mode. The result is that the sides of the screen, where the content didn't play in 16x9 mode, appear brighter than the center of the screen, which has seen much more action. This difference isn't super visible in real content, you'll really have to be looking for it to see it. Once you do notice it, though, it won't go away. Running long cycles does improve the appearance, and since we've switched to full screen mode, the difference between the center and the sides has lessened. But had we continued to blast CNN at 16x9, it's very likely that this damage would be irreversible and noticeable. Interestingly, the Odyssey G8 was the brightest of all three monitors in SDR. That was until August 2023, when Samsung released firmware update 1520, which disabled the peak brightness setting in SDR mode. Now, the G8 has the same brightness as the Alienware monitor, both of which are noticeably brighter than the LG. As to why Samsung throttled the brightness when that was a key selling point of this monitor, well, we're not sure of every reason, but it is safe to assume that this will result in reduced stress on the panel from less current running through it. Essentially, you're trading brightness for longevity. And while it's great that Samsung does these continuous firmware updates, and it is really great that they listen, take feedback, and are constantly trying to improve their products, consumers should at least know when their features are being traded off and why, so they can choose whether or not they want to make the trade. As for the age-old WOLED versus QD OLED debate, we still stand by our original claims that QD OLEDs appear less resistant than WOLEDs regarding burn-in at least for first generation panels at this point. The next generation of TVs seems to show some promise, as we've seen with the S95C appearing better than the S95B. But we're not sure if this applies to all second gen QD OLEDs due to potential software differences. At this point, we recommend using an ultra-wide QD OLED monitor only for gaming. General browsing and watching movies or TV shows, especially with a 16x9 aspect ratio, should be kept to an absolute minimum. It only took 700 hours for screen damage to occur on these monitors, or the equivalent of using it for two hours a day for a year, which really isn't all that much time. Of course, there's then the issue of warranty. If we take this year-long example, you could experience burn-in within that time frame, but whether the manufacturer actually covers burn-in depends on your region and where you buy the product. Some manufacturers, like Dell, state outright that burn-in is covered under warranty. Some others aren't as forthcoming. If you're concerned, it's best to check directly with the manufacturer or wherever you bought it. It's important to note that everything happening with our OLEDs is exactly what we expected. The concept is simple. The brighter the pixel, the more wear over time. And we're constantly blasting our OLEDs at their maximum and stressing them out with a stream of static content. Obviously, no sane person would use their OLEDs like this at home. Just know that if you do, you are more prone to developing burn-in over time. Burn-in is inevitable and inherent to OLED tech, but it takes time to significantly accumulate, especially if you're watching varied content. For that reason, we won't stop recommending OLED TVs. I mean, in terms of picture quality, they're pretty hard to beat. And in terms of longevity, they're at least performing how we expected them to, which is more than we can say for LCD models. For now, that concludes our 10-month update. Stay tuned to our channel for more updates from our longevity test and for some exciting news from our research and development team. Until next time, I'm Abby from Ratings.com, where we help you find the best product for your needs. Congratulations, you've made it to the end of the video. Next stop, our careers page, where you can see all our open positions. And while you're there, why not apply? Who knows, maybe we'll have the best job for your needs too.